Good afternoon and welcome to The Take Up. Today we have episode 133, Material Matters and Measuring Up. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to The Take Up. I'm glad to have you in on this Education Friday on this wonderful afternoon to discuss things about materials and dealing with materials, dealing with new garments, dealing with new kinds of materials we might use in our supplies, new threads, new stabilizers, and how should we handle these things? And why do they so frequently come to us as a surprise, or at least when we see them online, people are having issues and kind of throwing every manner of settings and materials together to try and make things happen without kind of going through the method of measurement, the methods of observation. And I think that's what we're gonna talk about today is how to handle new materials, how to look at new materials, and just do a, a kind of brief run through on some thoughts, especially kind of going through them via some samples I've shown recently and some people discussing them. So. Like I said, a lot of this today is just going to be talking about the way we think about our materials, the way we think about our garments, the way we handle the initial testing, and kind of getting a framework together on how we work with new materials. Uh, The truth of the matter is they can seem daunting and things can go wrong, especially if we start using materials that are very unfamiliar to us, that have uh, natures that are different than what we are used to using that aren't the standard. But I think that if we kind of change a little bit about the way we think about the materials and start to approach them logically, we can have a better time with anything new that we come across. And I'll discuss a little bit of some of the debate that comes up between materials that are made for embroidery and materials that aren't. I know we've talked about this before when we had the big versus showdown episode where we talked about different ways that we can do things in different methods and materials. But we'll discuss that a little bit too because I think that's all part of this discussion of how we use materials, maybe why we standardize in certain materials, and how to handle new stuff, new things we might encounter, unknowns. How do we handle these and what do we do with them and how do we achieve a level of repeatability, a level of getting what it is that we want out of our particular materials we're using, out of our particular designs that we're creating? How does that all jive and what can we do to make that, if not easier, maybe a little more regular, a little more regimental, a little more logical in the process? So many times I come across arguments, people discussing Uh, how to use new threads, how to use new stabilizers, what to do with a type of garment that they've never touched before. And it seems like it's the same kind of discussion we talk about diagnosing designs. I know we've had earlier episodes about diagnosing designs and embroidery to say what went wrong, how do we need to edit this? There's this tendency to do this kind of magical thinking where people just throw a term that makes them feel like they've got some control over it. I cannot tell you how many times I've heard density used, if not incorrectly. increasing or decreasing density as a panacea, as something that's supposed to fix whatever problem is in front of the person or stabilizer. So many times people have referred to poor stabilizer use for things that aren't related to the job that stabilizer does. (laughs) So we're going to talk about that stuff a little bit. I will show you some things. We'll actually break down also a design because I know we had some discussion about maybe talking about the way designs are put together more often and doing a little bit of design breakdown. Well, because some of this comes from a discussion of a material I shared recently of a new thread, or at least not a new thread, but a thread that was new to some people in my comments recently. Uh, We'll talk about the design that we had on screen for that and that I showed for that. So part of what this is, and I'll go ahead and show it because we have it in the, we have it in the thumbnail here. You see that there's some thick threads here, some uh, Bermelana and Bermelanico wool threads from Madeira particularly, but this could apply to any sort of 12 weight thick thread. You're seeing that there's some knits shown here. There's some, um, of that wash away puff that back in the day I knew as Q104, but uh, now multiple companies are running it as some sort of version of wash away puff foam and also some pictures of swatches. All of these things go together. But I really decided to do this topic because of this design and I'll be showing it to you multiple times. This is just a little small tester design that is actually part of a much larger design that I originally did. Uh, which was done with the wool blend of Ermelana thread. And I use, this is a very simple piece. There's no uh, silk shading done in this. There's no brushing to make it fuzzy. There's nothing else. This is literally just a very simple design made of a couple different motif style stitches or run style stitches and satins that was adapted. uh, A piece that was originally not made for that thread, but adapted for the 12 weight Bermelanum thread. So a much heavier thread. So we'll talk about that. We'll talk about thread weights. We'll define some th- some terms around thread weights and thick thread as well while we're going through this. Because I think a, a lot of this c- comes down to 
uh, certain camps, right? The, the things that I most often see people talking about are different thread weights. So thin threads, thick threads, and also threads that have different sheens. So we're talking about things like wool blends and cottons and puffy acrylics, things that aren't the standard polyester or rayon 40 weight thread <laughs> that's running through a maybe a 75, 11 needles, usually what I used to use, but a lot of people run smaller needles than I did back in the day. Um, but like I said, we're going to talk about that. Some of those terminologies that goes with that. We're going to talk a little bit about stabilizer. We'll talk a bit about uh, fabric construction to some degree just to discuss some methods, but a lot of this is really about how do we observe things and how do we come at the problem of new materials, new supplies that we haven't used before and how we get our results out of them. So that's what we're gonna talk about today. Uh, certainly we'll stop first. We're gonna talk about uh, talk to some people who are here in the comments. We've been having some technical difficulties today. I'm gonna to tell you this right now. So fewer people are getting connected than usual. I'm seeing some issues with comments today as well. If you're having problems, you may want to try the other streams. I am on several places, YouTube, LinkedIn. Uh, hey, I'm even on Twitch <laughs> as well as Facebook. If you're having problems somewhere, you may want to go to one of the other channels to go for that. And But so far, I'm seeing some comments from YouTube. I'm seeing some comments from Facebook. So hopefully, as we go along, this will filter out. But there have been some StreamYard issues kind of all day today. So here's hoping we don't have any more issues. But let's, let's say hi to the few folks who are in here commenting. And like I said, if you have anything, like I always say, if you have anything you want to talk about with this, if you have a comment, if you have a question, uh, if you have your own stories about particular materials and problems that you've had with materials and what you would do to fix these problems, what you want to kind of learn about, please, by all means, jump into the comments, join into the Q&A live and derail the show. It's fine by me. I'm here to serve the community. I'm not here for going through a set of points that I have listed ahead of time. <laughs> if I can serve you guys, that's what I'm here to do. Let's say hi to the few folks who are here already and chatting. We have Barb in saying good afternoon, everyone, and hi to me. Well, hi to you, Barb. Happy to have you in. Curtis is in saying good afternoon. Frank Dunn from over in the UK is here to say good evening and good evening, Frank. Thank you for being an awesome community member and sharing and always getting information out and bringing people together. It's awesome to have you here. Ramona, who also has her own show tomorrow, Coffee and Conversation. So afternoon, Ramona. Happy to have you in. And <laughs> here we go. This is absolutely the case. This is one of the ones that I'm always fighting with. We talk about thick threads and thin threads and people having magic solutions for everything. Ramona says, uh, letters could be three inches tall. And the first thing you hear is use 60 weight thread. Yeah, this is another one of those panacea moments. They think it's the, the healing medicine that will fix all problems with text is, is finer thread. The problem being, that though we know it, the first thing, what is 60 weight thread? I'm going to talk about thread weights and define that a little bit better in a moment. But we know 60 weight thread is th thinner, about 25% or so thinner than our 40 weight thread. That's how it runs. And even if we're having some sort of issue with binding up in the corners or some excess density, uh, you may not be at that density throughout a letter. You may not be at that density throughout your design. And if you just throw a 60 weight thread at it, you're you're essentially decreasing your density by 25%. This is the thing I say in all of my classes where I talk about small lettering or where I talk about density and threads. If every design from your digitizer is originally is meant for 40 weight thread, but when you run it in 60, it looks better, the likelihood is your digitizer is using exceedingly high densities and you should probably tell them to back them down. <laughs> this may be a digitizer problem. But yeah, everybody has a tendency to like throw that out there. I've seen lots of groups where if there's any problem with edge quality, if there's any problems with uh, clarity and lettering, they go straight to the 68 thread and the small needles. The thing is, it's not always the healing, you know, like I said, the healing medicine for all ills that you might think it is. 68 thread is really great for fine letters. It should be digitized for mostly unless there's excess density there, which there might be, but just throwing 68 thread at any letter that looks funny is not necessarily the answer. And also there are uh, there are reasons why you may not be able to use the smaller 65.9 needles. Uh, on certain materials, on certain structures, that needle's gonna be a hard pill to swallow. Going over the center seam of some you know, constructed six panels, you may not do too well with a super fine needle trying to get tiny, tiny letters to, to pop. That may not be the best idea for you because you'd be snapping needles every two seconds. Um, there are people out there who are running titanium 9010s because uh, caps are causing them problems with their designs, but then you, they want to go ahead and run tiny lettering with a super fine needle right through that same material that's been snapping those big titanium needles. Um, we should think about that. Part of the fit of this whole thing, we're talking about new materials and, and uh, new garments. We also have to think about needles in this case. 
needles should be selected. Here's the other thing too. Needles are selected, yes, for the thread, but also for the material through which we are sewing. Why do I always say through instead of on when I talk about garments? Or why do I try to remember to always say through instead of on? Is because we have to remember that embroidery is a process by which we will be driving a needle through all of the layers of material and stabilizer we put in front of it and that we'll be leaving behind thread that then is through the garment. Thread and bobbin are through the layers of the garment and remain there once we pull that needle away. That's what we're doing. We're creating those loops of thread that they go through the garment. That's the point. And that also leads to a term that I always talk about, which is maybe my, my term, and I don't know, hopefully it's kind of propagating now. Uh, we think about density in terms of measurement of how close together lines of stitching are, and that's a good way to think about it as a designer. That's great, but we have to think about density as to how many wedges of thread in what area are puncturing through our garment and how tight that makes the garment and how tight they are fitting together. That's part of our issue here is, is the thought about the nature of our material, the nature of our material and the nature of what we're doing. Uh, part of this issue is not thinking about the real process and the physical nature of what we're doing. So as we embroider, we should remember, we are stabbing our needle through our garment thousands of times, leaving behind threads in a garment that ostensibly, because it's covering a human person generally, unless it is uh, intentionally an open mesh piece, and there's some of that we can talk about, is going to have all of the threads it needs to be completely solid and maintain itself and not show any air through, you know, not show anything behind it. That material, once we start embroidering through it, we'll have to get out of the way of the thread that is there, and that can cause things like rippling and puckering and other distortions. We have to think about the nature of the things, and the same thing is true of our materials. If I talk about thick threads, well, what am I thinking about? I now have a thicker thread. I have, I'm leaving a larger wedge inside of my material. I am also needing less of that thread to cover in the same area. So my density has to adjust for that, but then I have to be even close, care, more careful in general about how close together penetration points are, how short my stitches are, because I'm thinking about the wedges that I'm leaving through my material and how many of them are close together. Those individual stitches start to pack together inside of that material and the thicker the thread is, I need those to be further apart so that I'm not causing that binding, that I'm not causing that excessive three-dimensional density, the density that goes through the material. So we have to think about that in all of this. We're talking about the nature of our material. So I, I will get further into it, but that's just something to kind of remember. It's the nature of the medium or the media. And in this case, talking about thread, talking about also material. Uh, the qualities of the material through which and on top of which we're sewing. So yes, I'm talking about the through, but there's also the top, the texture of the material itself. Where is this thread going to lay? If we start thinking about our garment, not as this flat plane in front of us, the way our software would show us a blank page on which we are painting with thread, that is a fine way to think of the design portion of it. But if we want to think about this physically, we should imagine ourselves walking on the surface of our material. And let's imagine that I have my corduroy material. Well, now I've got peaks and valleys. I'm talking about my knit hat. I have peaks and valleys and deep ribbing. And I'm going to lay my threads across it, even though I'm going through and then back down. I have my loop and you know I talk with my hands all the time. This thread is now laying on top of this. And let's say we're doing so along the valleys. Well, it may sink in between the middle. Means that stitch angles can have interactions with the texture, with the grain of the fabric that's going on to. The thing is, all of these textural elements, all of this stretch and loft, and the stuff that we're going to talk about throughout this episode today, are things that we can perceive. So I think sometimes we get into this kind of magical thinking, this concept where somebody tells us the name of a fabric and then we go start looking for the name of the fabric somewhere. And if we can't find it, we can't find settings for it. We don't know how people are handling it. Maybe we don't understand it and we feel like we don't know what to try. But what we have to realize is all of these adjustments we might make, changes we would make to our design, different materials we might use for support as in stabilizers and toppings, they're all there to either help with or counteract natures of the medium, right? Nature of the medium. They're here to contract texture. They're here to, to arrest stretch. They're here to lift things out of that texture on the top. They're here to stop thread from sinking in. They're, they're all here to deal with the nature of the material itself. And those are things we can deal with because most of the time, 
uh, no matter what kind of sphere of embroidery we're in, we have the material in our hands. We can touch the thing we're going to work on, or we can ask somebody for examples. And certainly, can we learn terminology? Yeah, we can learn terminology. We can learn what different types of fabric are like. And I'll admit, I don't know every type of fabric that's out there. The thing is, when the fabric is in my hands, I look for certain characteristics, and I use those characteristics to help me understand what I need to do to support that for embroidery. And here's the other thing. Every time somebody asks me about these things, they want pat rules where it's like, if I'm using X garment, what stabilizer do I need? Or X material, what stabilizer should I use for that? Those are fine rules to start from. But as many of you know who've been doing this a while, the interaction is a little deeper than that. And the material is only a portion of it. The design itself, because we are building it out of thread, and the design itself can have fewer or more threads, wedges that we're piercing through. It can have a higher density, a lower density. It can be a larger design. It can be a, a light design, one that is less, uh, less dense, that has fewer stitches to it, even if it's a large area. Or it can be a very densely packed design. And it's not just a density setting. I mean, the, the design itself, the globe of the entire design, the entirety of what this design is, has more going on within it. Therefore, it has more... Uh, more penetrations that are going to happen through the garment. It leaves more wedges of thread behind. It has more weight to it. It has more stiffness or density. And these things all play into what stabilizer we might need to use. The thing is that a lot of these things have already been studied. Uh, we don't necessarily have to uh, learn from day one, from moment one, everything over and over again. Luckily, a lot of this is stuff that we already can look up. We can go run and look up what we need. We can look up suggestions. And if we can't, if we don't find them, we shouldn't panic because all of these suggestions are based on, like I said earlier, the nature of the medium. It's based on either the nature of the thread, the nature of the material, and perhaps the nature of the design if we are considering that. That's not something you can always look up, but it's something we can kind of understand. Uh, certainly people like to give you pat rules for things like with stabilizers. Somebody will say, if it has this many thousand stitches or more than it deserves this stabilizer, the problem is if it doesn't take the area into account, um, 20,000 stitches in an area this large is a very different thing than 20,000 stitches in an area this large. So we have to think about kind of the overall nature of the design and the way it's put together. Also, if we have an area that's this large, but it's comprised of a couple designs that are further set apart from each other, we actually have fairly dense design here and here, even if the overall design area is something that has, you know, it, that is sparsely covered. If it has intense points of very deep coverage, then we're probably going to need to use a stiffer, more stable stabilizer to hold up to that kind of distortion, the kind of forces that we're putting on it. So we'll go through that stuff. We're going to have more to talk about. I'm going to show you some pictures. And like I said, toward the end, I'll probably do a breakdown because lots of people ask me about this particular design. So I'm going to run through and break that design down and show you a version of it so you can see a little bit more about what I did and, and what was on my mind thinking about the use of thick threads and how to integrate that and integrate those settings. But like I said, we'll get there. <laughs> we have a lot of stuff to talk about, but I think it's worthwhile to kind of give that stuff a little bit of breathing room to say, all right, let's right, let's, we'll talk about it. We'll come back to individual points and then we'll reiterate some of the stuff that's going on. But the crux of this thing is, though I always say materials matter, that's the first thing. Yes, stock designs exist. They are digitized for a happy medium. What we were always taught when I was younger, like I didn't take a lot of classes, but by the time I was already digitizing, the rubric I heard from people who made stock designs was that you essentially digitize for something that is a little stretchy, a little textured, and a kind of a medium weight cutaway, and that's the good, happy medium. You digitize for a piece of cotton pique polo with a single layer cutaway, and if it runs on that, then it'll probably run on something. It'll be a little heavier for something light, for a light material. It'll be maybe not quite enough for something with a lot of texture, but it'll run okay on most things. Otherwise, when we're dealing with extremes, we're dealing with very thick thread, we're dealing with very textured materials or high piles, we are going to have to digitize for and cope with the nature of those materials more. So that's that's one of those things. Do we need to make different versions of designs for every different permutation? Maybe, maybe not. If there are extreme changes in the nature of either the supplies we're using, like our threads, or even our stabilizer to some degree, depending on what you're trying to do or trying to achieve. And I'll talk a little about that. Um, 
and definitely if we're having you know extreme differences in our materials if we're going from a lab coat that is a very smooth, very solid material to, like I said, a corduroy or a knit cap, then there is a high likelihood we're going to have to make changes in our files and very likely changes in the support materials we use to get results that are similar. So to get similar results from the design, we are very likely to have to take our materials into account to make that happen. So materials do matter, but in that, the reason I also called this measuring up is that measurement is key and measurement can mean a lot of things. Um, it does mean understanding the measurements of embroidery. You should know what density is and how it functions, what pull compensation is and how it functions and same with push compensation, you should know that. And understand things like when we change parameters, so settings, in our stitches if we change things about like the inset on our edge run underlay the length of our stitches what those things are going to do what changing those measurements what changing those parameters will do to our stitching and what changes that can affect or how that can help with our materials or with that interaction like i said our interaction is between thread needle design material stabilizer or supplies and our machine those are the interactions. It is a complex interaction that luckily does boil down to something we can repeat. And most of the time is actually not that hard to figure out once we start understanding uh, the nature of our media, the nature of the medium that we're working in particularly. So it's one of those things, right? <laughs> it's one of those things. So let me go ahead and grab a couple more comments since we have these before we keep going on. Uh, Joanne says, the worst one is you wear it, don't tear it. Bad blanket statement, agree. Um, here's what I'll say. I agree to a to a point. In fact, you know what? I'll do this. I'm going to go ahead and get a comment from Ramona. She actually addresses this. Let's go with Ramona's comment first, and then I'll jump in with mine. But I will agree with this being a blanket statement, but I think I know why it happens. Let's just go ahead and bring in Ramona's comment first, though. I'd love to bring you guys into this process. Ramona says, I agree, Joanne. The problem is when we try to include the but if statements, they stop listening. No one wants education anymore, just a quick fix. That is part of the hard part. And I will say this too, folks, depending on what space you're in, if you're in a commercial space and somebody's hard up for something that someone's already paid for and they're trying to make it work on a machine, they're a lot more likely to listen to you than someone who's a hobbyist, who's doing one piece, who kind of can make it work and is not as you know concerned about every piece of, of the puzzle that you might be. And they might not want to become a full embroidery professional just to put a design on a garment. And that's okay. I think that's a hard thing for us who are professionals who kind of came up from a commercial standpoint or really do geek out like you must be if you're sitting listening to me today on your Friday afternoon. Um, it can be hard to understand sometimes that people don't necessarily want to become material scientists to get this stuff figured out. At the same time, I think for those of us who are, you know, I think that's what we have to kind of figure out, right? We have to kind of figure out that um, it's okay that people don't necessarily want to hear a tremendous amount of this stuff and that some of these really blanket statements can still be valuable because here's what I'll say with this, with what Joanne said, the issue I have with, with it in that I don't want to just throw away the statement. If you wear it, don't tear it. I don't love it. And the Frank says too, Frank says, love that statement. Not. Yeah, I know Frank I'm with you too. Cause tear away can be used on things that you wear. Here is the issue. Tear away in some respects, people uh, mistakenly think that stabilizer only needs to be present in a garment in order to get it stitched out and that it doesn't have a job once that garment is stitched. And there are lots of people who see, stabilize, see tear away stabilizer as a way to not have an unsightly stabilizer piece on the back of their garment. They aren't really taking into account the job that it does. So, you know, it's, let's talk about that since that wasn't, wasn't what I was going to talk about first, but let's go into it anyway. We need to talk about the job that Stabilizer does. And it's the same thing with, with threads and thread weight, which is what I was going to talk about first. Well, we'll get that. We'll do that later. Let's start about Stabilizer and backing first, because that's something there. Number one, first thing I, I'm going to make a point about one more time, why do I continually say Stabilizer over and over until the word seems to stop having meaning instead of saying backing? Why do I think that's a better term? Um, number one, because of this, stabilizer has a job. It does a thing. Backing is a thing that goes in the back. Doesn't seem like it has a lot of jobs. Stabilizer has a job. Stabilizer's job is to stabilize the fabric. What do we mean by that? Well, we are trying to arrest unnecessary movement and stretch. Stabilizer 
stabilizes fabric. That's why I, I'm so hardcore about saying stabilizer repeatedly. Stabilizer has a job. Backing's just something in the back. And in fact, there are things that are backings. Uh, I know one of the pro the uh, products, the commercial name is Cover the Back, I think, when it's from Gunold, but it's it, they, they, they exist in lots of places. There are materials used to cover the back of stitching to make it more comfortable for people to wear so it's not scratchy, especially in the children's wear arena. Um, that is That to me is a backing. Yes, it can enhance the stability of a design somewhat by fusing a material to the back of a garment. So if that thing is stretching out or, or acting strangely, that can sometimes increase the stability long term of the garment. But it's largely made for textural reasons. It's used to keep the embroidery from being scratchy when it's right against the skin. Um, especially with metallic embroidery, that stuff can be a lifesaver to make something feel more comfortable. If you've got a, a fairly heavy metallic logo that's on a polo shirt right against the skin, um, some metallic threads can be particularly scratchy, and putting some of that fused stuff on the back is great. But it doesn't do the job of stabilizing. When we're talking about cutaways and tearaways and all of those, it stabilizes the fabric, right? That's the job that it's doing. And and the problem with our statement for sure is that, yeah, blanket statement, I don't love it that it's a blanket statement because there are reasons why we can use tearaways and, and full washaways. I've got stuff that is uh, stuff you can wear, but it has very light embroidery on it. And I use complete washaway stabilizer. And when I wash it away, the stabilizer does not exist in, at all. It's not in the material at all. But that's okay for the look that I was going for. Right? And I think that really depends. In fact, I'm going to go ahead and share a piece. We've talked about this piece before, and I'll share it up on screen again if I can throw it on screen shortly. Looks like I might not have grabbed this one, but you know, it, it's one of those things where I've done some pieces where I've used wash away stabilizers, but I understand that what I'm going to get out of the piece is something that may or may not be acceptable depending on if you are okay with what happens when you fully wash away the stabilizer. Knowing the nature of the thing is what possibly partially makes it okay. If we know what we're getting and we're okay with the result, we can do all kinds of different stuff with it and it can be okay. And here's the one that I'm talking about. This is a piece called that I call the Lotus and Ohm. And this was done originally with a material called Q104. It's one that I showed on the screen previously. And what you're going to notice if I zoom in on this is something that you would be horrified by in a lot of respects if you were doing a corporate logo. The light contour fills behind this are a little loopy. They're a little loose. They stand up a little bit. This, for me, was intentional. This is something that I wanted to do. What you're going to notice on this piece, this is a natural garment dyed shirt that was very light, very soft. And this piece, not only did I use the Q104, the, the lofty puff wash away material. I know Floriani is currently selling it. There's a few other people who are selling this wash away material for the topping. It is a topping that is thick like a piece of batting, and when you stitch over it and then wash it away, the stitches stand up. So underneath this satin stitch ohm was that material, but this entire thing was run on complete wash away stabilizer. So when I was done with this piece, yes, it held the machine or it held it stabilized while I was running this on the machine, but when I rinsed it away, it was gone entirely. What people don't remember is that we're dealing with a sandwich of materials that has a thickness. And when you remove the stabilizer from the equation, the thread that was tight on that thickness of material now has a thinner material to ride on. And this material in particular is light and a little stretchy. It has a little bit of loop that's going on. There's some loft. Those stitches are standing up a little bit on top of that material more than you would ever want from a commercial logo. In the context of this fashion style piece where it is supposed to look weathered, the distress texture on the ohm was entirely what was expected. And the concept was I have a piece of embroidery that is about eight inches wide on this piece that is completely soft and pliable. When you wear this, it, it flows with the garment entirely. It's completely soft, completely pliable. And yet because of the wash away puffy stabilizer has a certain height to it. Because I knew the nature of the material, this was okay. And I understood what I was going to get. How did I understand it? Largely through testing, largely through testing. Certainly I asked the manufacturer. In this case, I was actually testing this for the manufacturer, but we talked about it. And, in, and with most things, you're going to be able to look this up with new materials. You wanna look at what stabilizer is good for. There are materials to talk about that. And I'm actually gonna show you that in a second. Most materials manufacturers and vendors are going to have guides 
that help you to use the materials. Are they the end of what you can do with the material? No. Yes, they tend to give you a baseline that is a good place to start for working with the materials. When it's thread, it will include things like the appropriate needle that is necessary for running it. It will include things like the density at which you should digitize. We'll talk about that in again a second. I talk about thick thread. And in the case of stabilizers, it will give you concepts about the kind of designs and the kind of materials that you can use to make things run. In this case, uh, I knew what I was getting into, but I will admit that if I just didn't want to see stabilizer and I used a full wash away stabilizer just so I wouldn't have to look at it in the back of the garment, but then I ended up with this kind of looping that you're seeing in this piece where there's a little bit of shadow. Those loops are certainly standing up in that Lotus. You can imagine that I wouldn't like that result. The thing is, the context in which we do things matters. And I've talked about this in previous episodes. In a piece like this, that's retail style, that's fashion styled, where I did not mind the texture and in fact was courting this concept of multiple layers of texture, this is acceptable and desirable. If this were a corporate logo, it would be less desirable and I would have to think about what that stabilizer does, what job the stabilizer is doing, and what I mean that job to be, what I mean that to end up with. So yeah, I agree. Don't don't always love blanket statements. I'm with Frank. It's not perfect. But, the, uh, but I also understand Ramona's right that sometimes when we're talking to people, they're not here to listen to all the different stuff. What we sometimes can do is, like I just showed you, say... If you wash away the entirety of your stabilizer, there's a chance you get this. And on, in the same note, I've also shown people that if you rip stabilizer off of really light materials and you're not very careful about how you do it, you can create holes, you can cause issues with stability in general, or if you have something like, uh, let's say, uh, disconnected letters. This piece, the other thing about this piece to remember that I showed you is that it's entirely connected. There is an entirely stitched in area that's behind the entirety of the design. The satin areas are all connected and close together. They are not floating separately. One of the things I see frequently that people do that causes problems is they will either have text or they will have multiple large letters that are separated from each other on something like a knit hat. They don't want stabilizer in the inside, so they use a tearaway stabilizer or something that washes out. And then when they put it on someone's head after they've washed it away or torn the entire thing away, there's nothing keeping the lettering together. These multiple separate letters that are on a row, um, they are now no longer connected. We have multiple pieces that are now connected. You know, they're not the same way. They are all separate and so when they put them on someone's head on someone's you know spherical dome what ends up happening is the letters will sometimes tilt they'll sometimes stretch apart or they won't stay cohesive and one of the things that you might have to look at is that using a cutaway in that respect that cutaway would be holding those letters together and maintaining the layout of your design where disparate elements that aren't together would stay connected by the stabilizer that's holding them all together. If you get rid of that stabilizer entirely, now those individual pieces of embroidery can float around apart from each other as you stretch the garment. So, and that's, that is true. And I'll, I'll go ahead and go with Joanne's statement on this. Yet you need to consider the stitching, the watch, washing, the drying, and the wearing. The full context of the piece. And in that case, what is that really talking about as well? It's what we talked about earlier, right? It's the nature of the medium. How does the fabric behave? Does it stretch in any one direction more than another? Does it have, like I said, texture? Ribbed knits are, are one of the ones that's very much in play for that, where we have valleys and peaks. Corduroy is one of those, if you, if you easy to at least remember, because it's something that we all kind of know that texture off the top of our heads. Um, but knits are certainly there. And honestly, even t-shirt knit, jersey knit has a vertical grain where thin vertical lines can fall into it if we don't use a topic. So in our digitizing and using our stabilizers materials, we have to think about the way that the material behaves, right? The way that the material behaves is part of this entire equation. And it depends on the material. We have to understand that materials behave differently and they're just not the same. And in fact, to illustrate that point, I usually show this image, right? This is the image you guys have probably seen me show a million times where I'm like, this is what out of the swatch cabinet at my old shop. 
Uh, and what was the swatch cabinet? Whenever we had a garment that could not be reused or something was damaged, because most of the work we did were left chess pieces, we would actually pre-cut swatches that fit our 15 centimeter hoops. We had some untouched garments, but we had a little library of stacked, uh, stacked shelves that had different materials in different colors ready for us to pick up and sample on when it was time to do sampling. We created our swatch library with these pre-cuts. But if we look at these different pieces that are here, it's really easy to tell what we're talking about, especially we start zooming in. This right here, that is a piece you can see this the sleeve here. So here's our hem on our sleeve. That's a piece of t-shirt knit, that's jersey knit. And what we can see right here on this angle is we have those vertical lines. That's that's what we have from that knit. We have grain and thread is thin enough and even th thinner threads, especially more to that case, that if our lines line up exactly with that vertical, they can start to sink in and satin stitches where the, the threads themselves line up on that vertical, the edges can become rough as it sinks in selectively to each of those little pieces of that knit. Each of those hills and valleys start to separate things out. We look at a classic kind of PK polo, or we may have a basket weave. In this case, it's a PK. If you look at this piece and we're looking at a high magnification, sure, but imagine when we get our lettering to the smallest size possible, a satin stitch lowercase i may have a dot that's small enough to fall right into one of these little buckets, right into one of these baskets, these tiny, the PK dips that are in this piece. And especially if we have something that's deeper or larger, like a basket weave or textured polo shirt, that can literally drop those in and they'll kind of sink in. You might miss small details, dots, stitched stars, things that are small and round can fit right in there. And also really short stitches can kind of sink into that unevenly. So that's why we often use a topping. We use a water soluble topping or water soluble film to keep ourselves from falling in. And I have chambray here. What's interesting about chambray? If we kind of look at the edge of this chambray, we see these little white threads that are in it. Frequently people have issues where they think bobbin is coming up when they're stitching on chambray and there's a white halo around the piece. But the white halo is actually the fact that it's only dyed on the face. And when we pull back on the edges of that, the threads on the face are dyed, but inside the warp of this piece has white threads that are exposed when stitches under tension are st stitched through them. The other time that happens is when we're dealing with uh, we're dealing with sublimated materials that have a fully sublimated pattern on white polyester. Sometimes when we stitch through them, the surface that is sublimated, the surface threads that have been dyed by the sublimation process are pulled away and we see the threads behind them in the structure of the fabric showing around the edges so we see a white halo the structure of the fabric and the nature of the fabric determines what we do the rest of this you know we have a nice uh twill piece that's not going to act very strangely it doesn't stretch too much and that's something that's really forgiving but if we treat twill and we treat uh sweatshirt material or we treat so fleece or french terry or this jersey knit the same way, we're not going to have the same results. And most definitely we're looking at a piece of um, stabilizer here. And this stabilizer actually has a grid in it. You can see kind of the grid of material. So it's a reinforced no-show stabilizer. This stabilizer does not behave like any of these materials. And because you can see the grain goes all different directions. Well, what is that? When we talk about wet laid stabilizers, the fibers in the stabilizer are laid in all different directions like felt is. Why is felt so nice to sew on? Because the fibers are not in any one direction. They're not woven together like these are. Because those fibers go all around, it doesn't stretch or compress in one direction very much. That's why stabilizer is stable. That's why felt is easy to run on because it doesn't stretch or compress in one direction more than another. So you don't see as much of the distortion that you see from stitches pulling toward the center or pushing toward the open edges of a column or of a film. Because of the nature of the material, we understand there's things we have to do. And the thing is though, that means when we encounter a new material, when we encounter a new piece of material we have to work on, we just have to think about the things that affect our embroidery that the material has, the qualities that it has that can affect our outcome and work to counteract any negative effects of those materials. So what are we talking about, right? We're talking about the fabrics most of the time. These are kind of the tops, right? We have stretch. So anyone who is dealing with 
performance materials or NITS knows this very well. Uh, are we stretching in any one direction or stretching in all directions? Is there, and what can we do about arresting that stretch? And we'll talk about that in a second. We deal with loft or pile to some degree. So loft or pile. So in the case of sweatshirt knit, it can be loft because the texture on the on the surface is maybe not that egregious aside from the vertical ribbing that is often there even on a micro scale. Um, but it's the thickness of the material that causes things to sink in as they compress the material, it can sink and then we get um, the material tries to kind of encroach on the sides of things and make our satin stitches look narrow and make everything look a little smaller to some degree. Um, so that's kind of loft, but there's also piles. So we're talking about uh, toweling, uh, anything that has a high texture, right? So toweling, anybody who has done things like dash mats and, and carpeting, the things that are a little more extreme, or, you know, French terry garments or full-on toweling or back in the day polar fleece, which I don't see as much cut fleece. Definitely things like Sherpa, then we're dealing with pile. And that's where we have all of these fibers that are sticking out and those fibers have to be somehow tamed or held down or kept from poking through our embroidery or like I said, crashing in on it. We have this material full of fibers. We sew something down the middle and then the fibers around the edge fold over it, shadow it, crush in on it and cover the edges of our embroidery and make it look smaller or hidden or somehow obscured. So that's when we're dealing with pile and loft to some degree. And then texture. So because a piquet polo shirt doesn't really have pile or loft necessarily in extreme amounts, but it does have texture. It has a texture that can cause the edges of our satin stitches to become a little sawtoothy. Or we can have things like meshes that really do just have a lack of material there. And that is not exactly texture. It's more of a question of structure. But if we're stitching over a mesh like the side of a hat, we will have to do something to counteract the fact that there aren't threads in the fabric everywhere where we need uh, these stitches to hold on. The stitches have to hold on to something as they're compressing. Um, if they are not holding on to that mesh or they don't have, literally they're hitting a place where they're in the middle of a gap in the mesh, one of the diamonds in the mesh in the hat, that stitch hits right in the middle. It has nothing to hold on to aside from any stabilizer that's there. Um, and so it may sink in more than another stitch that hits at a different place on that mesh line. Uh, at any point, we're dealing with texture, but we're also dealing somewhat with structure. So stretch, loft, and texture, whatever material we're looking at, we're dealing with that. The other thing we can also be dealing with is the lightness of the material. If a material is particularly diaphanous, see-through, very thin, easily crushed, it doesn't have a lot of uh, stability or body to it, then we can find that it doesn't resist the pull of the stitches, the tension of the stitches very well, or when we build too many stitches on it, that it's heavy and that that distorts the garment itself that can weigh it down. The thing is every material we deal with will have varying amounts of this and we will understand what to do based on what is present. If it is very stretch, stretchy or if it shifts a lot or it's very smooth and shiny and it tends to shift in the hoop, we know that we really need to stabilize the fabric. If it's incredibly stretchy, we're going to need to use a stabilizer that will hold up to some of that stress. And we may do things like use temporary adhesives or use a fusible uh, stabilizer because by fusing the stretchy material to the fusible stabilizer or using a temporary adhesive, it's stuck in place and it can no longer stretch. And we also have to remember that what stretching is, when we're stretching something, we are uh, moving those threads in the knit further apart from each other. We are increasing space inside of them and they are going to rebound or the material itself has a stretch to the fiber itself. That's the other kind of stretch that we can have. And that stretchy fiber will recoil. So we know that one of the things we don't want to do is overly stretch it by hooping it incredibly tight because once we release the tension off the hoop, it will rebound into its original shape as best it can. Though if we stitched it down to some stabilizer, well, it can't rebound in that area. So the excess will rebound against our embroidery and we'll have rings of, of ripples and loops and problems all around the outside edge of our embroidery. We have to deal with the nature of what the material is doing when it stretches. So how do we handle that generally? Uh, stabilization. Uh, we talk about structural underlay. Go back to my episodes on underlay and you can look at how I use underlay to stitch the material down to the stabilizer before you run the top stitching just to help keep the stresses of embroidery from bothering it. 
And in some cases, depending on the material, you may want to use a tearaway and find that you can't use a tearaway because the material itself just doesn't hold up well to all these stresses. And you may want to leave stabilizer there, either to keep your design together when something does stretch or to combat some of the issues that might happen when you remove it. So it, really, all you have to realize is if it's stretchy, it is unstable. If it's unstable, we want to stabilize the fabric in order to run it, and it helps us to deal with the stresses of embroidery. Um, if we are dealing with texture, we know that we are looking at that garment as if we are walking on a field that it has ruts and hills and valleys, and we need to put a bridge over those valleys so that when our thread comes down on top of this piece, it doesn't sink into the valleys. It is not torn apart by these, by the texture on, on our surface, on our road that we're walking as far as the material. And so we want to use toppings. We use a topping to make a bridge. It makes a, it is a material barrier that has something for the thread to land on so that during the embroidery process, even if we're going to wash this away later, it forms a loop at that level that is not sunken down into the material so that when we wash the topping away, the loop is already fixed in place by the process and we don't sink in. So topping, what is topping doing? It's mitigating texture. It is providing a stable base on which we're going to sew so that our stitches don't sink into the texture of the material. When we mitigate that texture, it allows the stitches to form at a level where they're not sinking in so that later on, even if it's something we wash away, which topping generally is, it often is a wash away water soluble film or a heat away film of some kind, we will have formed our loop up at the top at the peaks of that texture and it can help with that issue. The other things we can do to mitigate texture in our designs, we can adjust stitch angles so that we don't fall into the grain of material as much as possible. If we have lots of little tiny straight stitch vertical lines on something, we may want to look at the angle of those lines or if there's some way that we can not have exactly match with let's say vertical ribbing, and we might do something either in our underlay or by adding a global underlay or a mesh like a knockdown or something that is not a topping material. We can create thread bridges over that texture by having stitching that does not match the angle upon which we lay our top stitching. So that's really what we're dealing with, right? It is different depending on the stuff. So it really depends, really depends. So we have some more stuff to talk to. So let's talk about some of the other people who are there. We have some other comments who are in. Let's see what we're talking about that one. And it's pretty interesting. Uh, we have some other people going on here. So Liz says, the more I learn, the more I realize this is a loaded subject. Okay, I yeah, sometimes it can. Um, and this is uh, why stock design is sometimes a disaster. In addition, I can now recognize a badly digitized design. Yeah, here's the thing. I will say this, badly digitized designs, Sometimes they are badly digitized. Sometimes they are not meant for the thing we're trying to do. And that's why stock designs can be a disaster. And even if they're not badly digitized, some are just flatly badly digitized. If the assumption is, which it almost always is, that they are digitized for 40 weight thread, and you look at the densities and they are incredibly high. You see that the spacing between the threads is much less than the 0.2 mils between individual rows or 0.4 that is there for most, you know, the standard density for about three lines of thread. And we can talk about measurement in a moment as we get into that. Overly dense designs, overly short stitches, too many layers piled into small areas, especially too many penetrations in one small area. And we can say, okay, that was digitized in such a way that they didn't take into account how dense they were getting. They didn't take into account the materials they were using. Um, sometimes, however, I will say this, I've seen somebody blame a design for being badly digitized when someone takes an incredibly heavy design and puts it on a very, very light material and it doesn't hold up or a very stretchy material and they don't use any uh, support stabilizer or anything. Uh, in that case, sometimes it's like, let's put it this way. It's like having a Lamborghini and then taking it off-roading and you're, man, Lamborghinis are terrible cars. They might not be terrible cars, but they're probably not great for Pikes Peak. You might not want to go up a mountain <laughs> and go four-wheeling in a Lamborghini. Does it mean it's a terrible car? Well, it's just not meant to go off-roading with. Um, that's not necessarily the case. There are plenty of designs out there that are auto-digitized or poorly digitized where the person has not put thought into the process of how they put the design together. Uh, but you will, I will certainly agree. Um, Yes, some design stock designs can be a disaster. 
uh, not only because people don't take a lot of care of them, there are people, but and not, like I said, a lot of digitizers are doing awesome stock design work. This is not a, a knock on stock design work. And in fact, a lot of the creators who are very specifically making their own collections of stock designs where they are working on them and care about them make excellent work. However, people like to buy lowest common denominator, cheap, cheap designs or massive collections on a USB drive somewhere that they're buying from eBay where it's like 300,000 designs for $10 understand that there is a value to these things and even digital products do have to have time put into them if someone's selling you that and it seems too good to be true it probably is and most of them are either stolen and then may or may not be good or they are auto digitized and if there's a massive collection and they're auto digitized they may just be spitting art through an auto digitizer not cleaning it up not worrying about it understanding that they can just inflate the count of how many designs are in a product and roll it out uh, being someone who now creates stock fonts and stock designs with great regularity, uh, I'm going to tell you that if you're doing it carefully, it takes a great deal of time and effort and is often not very profitable until you start making quite a few sales. Uh, so truthfully, it's more about the nature of the thing and what it's meant for and what flexibility it has. Lots of times we're talking about stitch files. There isn't a lot of flexibility. It's hard for us to adjust things like uh, to adjust things like density, stuff like that. So it can be difficult. Also, I see people really talking about uh, the wash away puff materials. Um, here's the thing. Uh, Barb was saying it's okay for some items, but not great for caps, cap foam for caps. Yeah, here's the thing. It is not meant as a replacement for cap foam. Uh, wash away puff. I just want to make that really clear for everybody. There are people who are selling that wash away puffy material that looks like quilt batting as a replacement for puff foam. It's not a good replacement for puff foam. And you can call that on me and say, I'm the one who said it. I will tell you, in my opinion, you can take it as my opinion, but 100% this is not a replacement for 3D foam. Kind of like I showed you guys earlier, and I'll bring up the design that I was discussing. This is not a hard enough, high enough crown for something that I would want to be 3D like 3D foam. And once it is washed, you can see that we have texture in here and the stitches are not all evenly the same height. And there is a looseness to it. Wash away puffy material, lets those stitches form that crown much higher than the level of the garment because it's there when it starts out that way. But they can also get crushed down when you're washing them. You have to wash them carefully. It does uh, leave loops that are open. They do absolutely sit up higher than the surface of the material. But when it is washed away, it is gone. It washes away entirely like any other fully wash away with soluble stabilizer. It's a bad representation of 3d foam so i'm just going to tell you guys absolutely i'm going to agree with with uh, joanne on this one yeah if you or barb on this one if you are considering it as a replacement for cap foam don't it's not um it's really cool for certain garments i'm going to say for me part of the problem i had with it absolutely is that it it was something where commercial customers are infrequently okay with laundered goods and this is also one, understanding the nature of garments, understanding the nature of the business. Commercial customers want a, want a garment that looks like it just came out of the box, still has the sizing on the material, uh, does not appear to be washed. There's no pilling or peaching or any of the things that happen when you wash. And most of my commercial customers were not willing to put up with us washing a garment out or with getting back a garment that had a big piece of material on it that they understood would wash out themselves. They didn't like the finish. And so in our shop, I tried to make it a thing and I only had two customers really took it up, took it up with this long term and down the road. Admittedly, the sad thing was when it was discontinued for some time, because that material did kind of go out of circulation for a while. I had customers who were then very sad because we couldn't get it because they very much loved. I had made aprons. It was a boba company, you know, boba tea. They loved this puffy material, but they didn't want to have a foam on their garments and the issue was that they didn't want foam, but they wanted it to stand up and be a little bit prominent and look a little bit like it was embossed. And for them, this was the perfect material. They loved the texture. It was like a natural material or it was a natural look that was kind of rough, but still had some texture and puff to it. And they knew that they could wash and abuse the garments. And as long as, uh, because I didn't keep the loops so long, they would be caught on things. I was careful about the way I did the sizing of the entire uh, logo and the garment. They could wash this thing pretty much like they wash anything normally and they wouldn't have issues throwing it through a dryer. It was fine. Uh, and believe it or not, you may not want to do that with all threads. If you're talking about that wool thread I showed you earlier, 
follow the washing instructions. We'll talk about that in a second. But for them, it worked very well. It just wasn't for everybody. And that's the thing. You have to know the nature of the material you're working with, and that includes the supplies you're working with. But let's go on from that, right? We talked about this uh, quite a lot, and there's other stuff that's going on. And by the way, Liz, no, you're totally right um, about the digitizing. Sometimes they really are badly done. Like I said about the densities, you're right. Bad pathing and a gazillion thread jumps. Revisiting the same colors over and over and over again when you don't need to. Not using traveling stitches. Uh, you can definitely see an inefficient design, and I would totally agree. It's not that I wasn't, you were being clear enough. I was just making a point. Yeah, making a point that sometimes in the, uh, like I said, just the same way as people have magical thinking about adding 68 thread to everything to try and make it look cleaner. Uh, there are also people who think that there's magical thinking that every design is poor if it doesn't run in every configuration possible. That the uh, $5 you spend on that stock design or often 99 cents they spent on the stock design means it will run on everything forever and it should be right or the digitizer is wrong. Um, yeah, can be rough sometimes, but I totally agree. Tons of people who jump too much, trim too much, and we all know if you're a, a part of the crews around this show all the time if you're a reciprocator you know when are you going to have thread pull out or a thread break or a problem that stops your machine it's going to be at a trim and a jump it's going to be at a color change so you want to reduce those as much as possible if you want to run clean and keep on running so yeah absolutely you can recognize a design that's done in a way that is not good for your machine or is not good for your bottom line for sure all right and uh, john says some people don't even own an iron yeah that's a the same thing with washing instructions folks um it's so hard. Sometimes you have to be very clear with people and with specialty materials, even more so, right? We have to deal with that quite a bit. But that was one of the things I wanted to talk about briefly, right? So I wanted to talk about thread weight and thick threads because that was the big piece that kind of started this whole commentary. Um, and I actually have some things to discuss that were about from a class that I taught on this. So just to make this clear, because this is a class I taught before, you're getting class slides. These are directly from one of my classes, and I'll go ahead and throw this into presentation mode so you don't have to look at my taskbar while we're talking about this. These were taught at Impressions Expo some time ago, but it's something that I just wanted to bring up because people ask me about thread weight, right? When we talk about thread weight, I, like I said, the uh, that the thread I just showed you earlier, um, this is a 12 weight thread. When I say that, um, we are talking about thickness to a degree, but the reason why it's called thread weight is because the measurement when someone says 40 weight or 12 weight is actually a measurement that actually takes weight into account. So some people don't always like that measurement when we talk about thickness. Thing is, generally those numbers are going to also refer to thickness. But because it's weight, there are material considerations in there. I just thought I would define that for folks. So thread weight is actually a measurement of the length of the thread to meet a standard weight. So 40 weight thread means that uh, 40 kilometers of the thread weighs one kilogram, right? <laughs> so that's the thing to remember. It's actually how much of this thread would it take to get to a certain weight? So that's what that weight means. So why thicker threads have a smaller number in the weight classification is because you only need that much length, a shorter length of thread to reach the same amount of weight. So why is 12 weight thicker than 40 weight? Well, that's very much like gauges. Uh, this, in this case, though, it really is related to weight. It only takes 12 kilometers to be as heavy as 40 kilometers of the 40 weight when we're talking about 12 weight thread. That's wild, I know, it's just a weird thing. That's why also you'll see, uh, if you're not in the US, you may not use thread weight. You may see tex measurements. Um, those are just a little bit different. They increase as the thread gets thicker because it's a little more intuitive because people don't always like the fact that uh, with with the, th the weight numbers that we have them in the US, the 40 weight, 12 weight, that the 12 weight is thicker with a lo lower number. Uh, so tex numbers are different. Um, it's measurements of the weight for 1,000 meters of thread. So a text 25 is 25 grams per thousand meters. So that's the thing. And so as text numbers go higher, the thickness generally is going up. So it's about weight, but this is the thing. This is where I got back to measurement one more time. I know that if you're part of my crew, you may be tired of hearing me talk about measuring densities. However, this is so critical to our understanding, especially when we're talking about thick threads of how we should be digitizing and how we should be setting parameters that I absolutely must continually tell people in case one of the people who have shown up today still doesn't know what density is. Uh, density is a measurement of the space between lines of stitching. And I often call them courses of stitching because we look at the way this is put together. Uh, we're actually looking at 
from one line across a return to the next line. So if we look at this over here, and I'm going to go ahead and put pointer focus up so you can see it even better. Let's go ahead and bring up my pointer if I can get that to run. Here we are. So you can see my pointer here. When we're talking about measuring density, here's our satin stitch block from one straight line across. When we're using a satin stitch, there is a straight line and an angled return that are very visible and easy to see. That's how we can tell what I'm talking about when I talk about this course of stitching. We're going across our shape, so across our column, returning back and to that next column, and that's the measurement of space that we're dealing with. In this case, we're talking about 40 weight thread. A full density is generally four embroidery points or 0.4 millimeters. It is a measurement of space between the courses of thread. So we need to understand that that's also why density numbers are the way they are, where when we have you know, an eight point density is less thread than a four point density. Why? Because eight points is twice the space between courses as four points. So that's the thing. Target densities can be different, but that's that's what we're looking for. And that's our satin stitch. It is the same, essentially, in a uh, in a fill stitch. If we have our fills set with these nice little chisel points, it's easier to see because you can just literally measure from point to point on an edge. But if we are in the middle of a fill right in the center of a filled area we can still measure by just going from one thread across the second to the third so anytime we're in a design we can measure our density by using the, the measuring tool in stitch artist it's going to be the m key it's often the m key in multiple softwares we get out our ruler we can measure from one line across a second to the third and we will see that our density is that number in this case 0.4 millimeters that's also four embroidery points so that's a four point or a 0.4 millimeter density for each of these because each row of stitches is roughly 0.2 mils thick so why does it why does that weight so much right what does it matter 70 weight five weight thread is about half as thick as 40 weight thread we have to have half the spacing to get the same coverage same thing with our 12 weight. 12 weight thread is more than twice the thickness of 40 weight thread. Full coverage for 12 weight thread is between 0.8 and 0.9 millimeters or eight to nine points of spacing. And the great thing is with fuzzy threads, because threads are fuzzy, that's one of the things we know about them. The texture or the sheen can differ. Fuzzy threads cover more because there's little threads of fuzz coming off of the thread itself that actually just literally provides more coverage. So we can go up into that nine points and still get a very complete, a very full coverage out of it. So we also have to think about this. We're talking about the nature of the material itself. So let's go back to that again, right? We talk about the nature of our medium, right? The nature of our medium in this case being thread. We're talking about thread. Yes, we have thread weight, we have our thickness, but our texture is also important. And that means we need to think about what we're dealing with as far as our thickness and our texture when we discuss our needle size and our needle structure, part of the problem we can have with it is that we are literally just passing that thread through a needle, then that needle has to be able to accommodate that thread and allow it to move freely and create a loop. And in order to do that, and in order to punch a hole that is large enough also to let that pass cleanly through our material, because we know we're putting thread through the material, we need a larger needle with a larger eye. So that's the thing. Needle size and structure is often related, of course. Well, it's generally pegged to our thread size. Certainly, we can sometimes increase or work with different needles uh, that are dealing with specialty issues. I talked about titanium or thicker shank needles on hats. That is often the case dealing with that extra structure. However, really, it's about letting that thread pass through and form a loop the way it should. So needle size and structure is also going to be kind of based on this, right? So that's what the, these are the reasons why weight matters so much. Uh, sticker, thicker than standard threads need those larger diameter needles. Why are we doing? We're avoiding friction and breakage. If you're having a ton of breakage, you may want to look at friction points along your thread path, whether that's through your needle, whether that's also the way it's going through the needle plate, the way it's passing through tension discs, we're going to have to adjust our tensions because the tension discs are close together. And we're if we have them close together as they need to be to put that pressure on that 40 weight thread, and then we try and put the 12 weight thread through it. We're going to find that that same amount of space we're passing through is going to continually make more tension on that 12 weight than it does on the 40 weight. The thing is, these are all things we can test for ourselves. These are all things we can understand, especially if we have ourselves a tension gauge and we have some settings from the people who are making this material. We can start from those good baselines. 
And like I said on this one, needle size numbers, this is another thing just to kind of get those terms out there. They directly express the width of the needle's blade. So we're looking at it here. 75 and 11 needle has a 0.75 millimeter wide blade. That's what we're looking at. That's the size of our needle. 116s are one millimeter wide. So you can see if we have little teeny tiny stitches, we also have to think about stitch length because once we get larger needles, if we try and make super tiny stitches, we're going to be dropping that needle back in the same hole it just came out of. We have to let there be enough space for that big thick needle with that wide blade to move over and get into some new material before it punches down again. So when we're dealing with thick threads, we also have to deal not only with our densities, but with our stitch lengths to make sure that we have something that can run reliably and won't cause breakage. It also means that stock designs that are not made for thick thread likely are right out. We probably can't use them with thick thread, even if we do the magic trick of resizing them without, without any stitch processing so that they get to a size where the density makes sense. We can do that because if you resize a, a, a design, and let's say it's made for 40 weight thread, we make it twice the size or a little bit more than twice the size, and don't refactor the densities, there's a chance that you could run that with 12 weight if it was a simple enough design. Why? Because the spacing has now become twice as wide between the courses of thread. Might work, but you have to look at things like stitch lengths and the way the tie-offs are done and things like that to make sure that those minimum lengths on the stitches aren't so small that you could cut that uh, loop, that you could cut that stitch by jamming that needle back in that same place or too close to the previous stitch. So overly small stitches might not work on really large needles. So increased thread thicknesses and the larger minimum stitch length means that digitizers have to do things like reduce detail and increase things like minimum satin widths and gaps or holes and letters if you're going to do thick threads. So this is that interaction we talked about. We learn target densities and minimum stitch lengths for our threads, and that's how we work on them. And the thing is, that can even be threads where we don't know necessarily how to run them if they're not commonly used for embroidery. So there's something about that sometimes, right? There's some of the things that I, I've dealt with before where we will I will deal with threads that maybe are not intentionally made for embroidery in the first place. Uh, some of them, if they are within the realm of the thicknesses that will still run in your embroidery machine, can still be run for machine embroidery, especially things like construction threads and sewing threads. It's not something I'm always recommending, but what I would love for people to understand is that there are embroidery businesses around the world that for different reasons are running multiple kinds of thread, including thick threads, but also things like cotton threads and spun polyester. I know there are, uh, there are some eco-friendly houses where they do everything with organic cotton thread for embroidery. Yes, it makes more fuzz. Absolutely, there's cleanup. If you're going to do this Bermelana thread that I just showed you or any of the permutations from other brands of this thick wool blend thread, believe me, you're going to make fuzz and lint and you're going to have to clean it up. But it depends on your machines, right? Uh, you have to have your machine set up correctly for it. You have to work on it. And it depends on how that thread behaves. The thing is, we can look at the thread and we can know things about the nature of that thread that help us to figure that stuff out. And we can test for it. The first thing I'm going to just bring up and make kind of clear for everybody, though, is that most of the time, our producers, our vendors are going to give us something to work with. They're not trying to hide this from us. If we look at this particular piece, this is uh, Madeira USA and this is Bermelana Thread. I'm not a Madeira USA only guy. I've run everything from, you know, every manner of thread up to and including Isocord and Selkie. So stuff from Ackerman, stuff from Gunold, stuff from, you know, I've done a bunch of different threads. I've run everything. I've run Iris, which is fine thread, all these different threads. And I've run also threads that are non-standard for embroidery because I wanted a particular kind of surface quality. So it is a particular you know, thing you have to do. And I'll say this, um, Ramona says you have to adjust hook timing to run the wool bread thread. I haven't had problems with it. I know you can dial it in better. Just to, just to briefly answer that. I have run it without adjusting my hook timing and been okay. If you were running it all the time, 12 weight thread, you might want to talk to your machine manufacturer about what they would recommend. If you're having troubles with loop formation, perhaps. My experiences were running the kind of designs I ran with wool brand thread, it did not cause trouble. That has not been everybody's experience, and it may be that the tolerances are different for different machines. I don't know that, but my experience was uh, on the machines that I was running at the time, and this includes uh, mostly Tajima hardware at the time, 
I've run them on ZSKs. I've run it on, uh, honestly, old, my old commercial brother as well, and a couple of home machines. I haven't had to adjust anything there. I'm going to defer to the machine manufacturers if you're running 12 rate thread all the time. And I've also known somebody who was running a uh, really thick upholstery thread where they had to do some work with their timing because they were running that stuff with great regularity and it made their runs uh, simpler. However, my experience has been, and generally the word from Madeira has been that, that they don't expect you to have to adjust up timing on that 12 weight. But I will say this, uh, there are people who have recommended that. I would talk to your machine manufacturer and ask them what they say, because they're also not trying to hide it from you. They don't want you to have poor results. And like I said, uh, same kind of thing with um, Permalana thread. They don't want you to have per poor results. And I just want you to point this out. We're at the top of the Madeira USA page here, and they have a big list of all the threads with things like density guides, with stitch guides and depending on which th thread you're on and which material you're dealing with they talk about how things should be used they talk about our densities they talk about um, materials and the same thing can be said of uh, stabilizers as well uh, depending on what you're working with they often have full charts on this and i'll pop this out of here and we can check that out in a second but yeah the, generally your vendors and your machine manufacturers want you to have a good time with this stuff they are trying to help you run correctly reach out to them because the chances are you probably aren't doing something that's so far off the bead that it's never been done and yeah uh sally also says they have that info on the color chart absolutely in fact the other thing i want to mention about the color charts Look at the color charts for your thread and they have washing instructions. That's the other thing people have said to me about the wool threads is how do we wash them? How do we dry them? How do we handle them? Washing instructions are generally there and they're listed on the color chart. So if you have a color chart for a particular kind of thread, generally, I know, especially on the Madeira ones, there are washing instructions with uh, whether or not you can use bleach, whether or not you can use uh, what you can do for drying and how to dry or deal with them. With the uh, wool threads, they expect to do a lie flat dry. They don't want you to be uh, mashing those up and matting those up. And in fact, if you do the brushed version of the wool thread where it looks fuzzy, like people use it to make fuzzy animals, uh, then especially we're not just throwing that into a tumble dryer on high. Look for the washing instructions on the thread to do that. But yeah, um, like I said, Ramona, I haven't had to adjust it, but I'm not gonna be the end all be all on this one. There are machine people who, who want you to adjust it. And I think that you should talk to somebody if you are going to make a business of running this stuff all the time. My experience has been that I've been able to run it without problems. Generally, the biggest problems were just about making sure I had my tension dialed in. And um, I did and sometimes have to slow it down a little bit because I found that you know we're dealing with tight tolerances as far as some needle plates and I'm passing this pretty big thread through it and back. Uh, that's something that you may want to look at. And the other thing I'm going to tell you is if you just want it to be a little fuzzy, you're not trying to get this super thick handmade look, I will often recommend people think about spun polyester thread. There's different places you can get that. And I know this is going to sound crazy for me who tends to recommend that everybody kind of um, use materials that are standard for embroidery. I have used sewing or serging threads and threads that are made for industrial sewing in my machine. Um, because they are generally not a, a great deal of thickness different than other threads you might use, and because I did density tests to figure out how it works. And one of these things we want to talk about today was how we th look, think of things logically, and one of those ways is by doing testing. You guys know that I'm really big on testing. Uh, it's something that I always talk about, and I'm going to bring this up, right? I have in my little document here some different things that are related to the testing, related to the things I was doing, and one of them is this, right? This test is me figuring out the densities of a spun polyester thread. And in this case, this thread is not marketed as an embroidery thread. This is marketed as a construction thread. It is, however, full polyester. It can run at full speeds. And our machines, the way they're made, are very similar. The way we form a stitch is very similar to a sewing machine. The thought that an industrial sewing thread that was made for you know being used at high you know at high speeds and sewing can't hold up to embroidery, I kind of say you know what yes it can. Is it something that I want to use for all of my customers all the time? Not necessarily. I would generally reach out to my thread vendor and saying hey can I you know what do you think about this process? There's a reason to ask them ahead of time first. I'm going to be honest and say that in the real world, when I was just trying to make something happen, 
this thread, which was not mar marketed for embroidery, absolutely worked fine for me. And when I did a density test on it, I went through steps from this right here is a 0.4 millimeter density at the bottom right hand corner. And we're at about half density or, or less up here. And I stepped it up by small increments until I got to coverage that I was happy with. Because though this is very nice coverage here, it's a little too tight. And I'm going to say most of the time on 40 weight polyester thread made from embroidery, I'm probably going back to about here when I have this same pattern that I'm running with the same densities. I can back up about, you know, 18% from that pattern and say that's good coverage. On this particular thread, I can go back a couple more squares. The texture changes a little bit. But I'm looking at coverage here and saying I can go all the way up an entire row and maybe even one more square back from there. And because of the thickness and the fuzz of this thread, I can get densities that look like full coverage which with a much lesser number. Um, yes, I could go crazy. I could get out my USB microscope, which yes, I really do have sitting on my desk, and I could try and measure or I can get out a... Uh, I get out the USB microscope or I can get out my uh, high-end optics that have the ability to measure very small things and try and calculate the thickness of the piece. And I could try and do it that way. If I'm fairly confident that the, they will run through my machine without causing problems, the other thing I can do is a test like this, where as long as I don't go outlandishly high on the bottom end here, really that's where we may run into problems is really small stitches or really tight densities. As long as I'm not outlandishly high, I can go ahead and do a test like this and just let the embroidery and the combination of thread and material and stabilizer I intend to use teach me the right numbers. So swatch testing is still kind of where that works for me. And honestly, I think it really can work wonders sometimes. And especially when you don't have the right materials at hand or when you want a specific quality. We talked about knowing the nature of our medium. When you want a specific quality that's not available in the threads that you can get for what you're doing. Uh, and I'm going to tell you this. I know very high-end decorators who make work for high-end merch where they want a fuzzy texture and they use spun polyester threads for embroidery, threads that are very similar to the threads that I'm showing you in that test. Just because it's not the standard thread that's made just for embroidery doesn't mean it necessarily can't be used. And if we go to the, the what I always say is like, go to the high street, go to the box stores, go to the mall, go to a department store and look at decorations, you're going to see different kinds of thread textures being used. Um, metallics and polyester and rayon are not the only things and metallics aren't the only specialty and even up to and including the lovely fuzzy threads we just showed you aren't the only specialty that are available um, you can most certainly go further than that and find other materials and I, like i said I, and especially if you're doing this for art or craft by all means try some things and go a little bit beyond the only reason that i tend to standardize commercially is to make sure that when I'm doing commercial work that I am charging for, that I have am on a schedule for, that I know I have to deliver by a certain time, that I have repeatable results that I can trust every time. In that case, for those kind of results, it makes sense for me to run threads that are made for embroidery that I know absolutely are going to work under the conditions I expect. What I'm going to be honest about is say that, there are other materials you can use. And if you're using them for the right reasons and you're being logical about how you test for them, then we can use those materials to great effect. It's about knowing the material. It's about knowing what you're going to get out of it and understanding what it's going to do. It's very much like I said about the earlier piece, the Lotus Ohm, and I'll put it up again just to say it. Um, if I didn't know that the wash away stabilizer was going to loosen the stitches and I decided for a customer to tell that customer out of the gate without testing, absolutely, I can do a design for you that doesn't have any stabilizer in it, that completely washes all the stabilizer away. And then I, I rock up with this piece here, and they look at it and go, that's loopy. And I go, yep, that's how that's going to work. Uh, I found that out while I was testing. That may or may not be okay, right? That might not be okay with my customer, and they might be unhappy with the textures that I got here. Or if I tell them, oh, yeah, I can do puff without using foam, I can use that wash away puffy material and you'll get a nice big crown and puffy stitches. And then I, once again, rock up with this thing that's textured and a little loose once it's washed. And I go, well, yeah, it's higher than normal and it looks cool. But they didn't understand that and I didn't know that was what I was going to get. It's no longer acceptable. So that's why standards exist. Standards exist so that we have reliable results that we can sell to people and that they understand are going to work. And 
we don't end up running into things like massive amounts of thread breakage or problems with things not staying stable with spoilage because we have like outlines not lining up or bad registration that stuff is hard to sell it's hard to deal with if you can't be reliable to a customer but when we're doing things that are creative when we're doing art or when we're developing something and we're learning from the process so that we can then sell that process to somebody else because that's the thing and yes i know i just put this up i'll put it up one more time if i came to somebody with this sample and they had never seen it and they asked me for something different than standard embroidery i said how do you feel about how this looks and I show them this sample that doesn't have stabilizer in it because it's entirely washed away and that has these distressed puffy stitches. And I'm like, man, I like that look. If I've already worked on it and I understand how it works so that I can produce this look over and over again, then it's commercially viable again because I know how it's going to behave and I can sell it on the reliable result that I can get. But let me be honest with you folks, when I make things for myself to scratch my own artistic itch, I go further afield and I test materials differently and I work with things in a way that I might not have otherwise. All right, but as I promised, I said I would work on some design stuff too and just show you some design stuff. Um, because this was the design that everybody originally wanted to see, I'm going to do a brief breakdown in our last little 10 minutes here of uh, the design that I originally started out with of the kind of Slavic flower piece that everybody had originally seen. So if you're here for that, let, we'll go ahead and do that. Like I said, earlier on, I did some of these and people got fairly happy about seeing me break a design down. So this is the piece we're talking about again. This is actually an isolated element off of a larger piece, but I'm going to show you the piece as it's put together and explain a little bit of what I did to achieve it. And we'll discuss uh, kind of how these stitches are put together. I have an older piece and then a reconstruction of this piece and we'll discuss the settings that are in it and you'll get to see what it is. This is a very, very simplistic piece. People are doing much more impressive stuff. And in fact, the uh, piece that I showed on my on my page from Madeira USA where they were explaining it, they had a silk shaded flower that is much more complicated than this, that is much more interesting in my to my mind than this. But for this case, this is a nice simple one to break down. And I actually very much like uh, the kind of rustic folk embroidery or bohemian embroidery it was called at a time, uh, like the boho chic stuff. I love that stuff, I really like it. So honestly, I thought I would show you this stuff. I think it's just a, a nice piece. So I, I will not claim to know all the origins of the art that I originally started from and everything else. What I will say is uh, Eastern European art was, was the original inspiration for the piece that I started from and that this flower is actually taken from a larger piece. And we'll discuss all that. But I'm going to put up some software and we're going to talk about it real briefly and kind of give you some concepts. Certainly, I'm also going to show you a couple other things while we're there. And we'll make let that be the end of our Education Friday. But if you have any other comments or questions, please come and hit me up in the comments over here. And in fact, I'll go ahead and grab a last couple of comments before we go on that one. Um, Barb says, woolly nylon serger thread. Have you tried it for embroidery? Um, I haven't done a bunch of the nylon stuff. I've done poly, but uh, I certainly would try it. Plus, there are people using woolly nylon threads that are uh, they're specifically, I believe it's filane, I think is a nylon. I can't remember who makes that off the top of my head. It just, it just vacated my brain. But that's another one that runs at 12 weight. That is very thick, but the look is a little bit different from the wool the wool blend threads and also there's the cotton blend stuff and i know i don't think i've got one to show you right off the top of my head actually yes i do i'm going to go ahead and try and show you guys uh, one of my other pieces that uses a thick thread uh, and this was cotton since we're talking about different fibers i'll go ahead and pop this up really quickly um, this is another one that was interesting this is using a cotton thread this is bermalonico and i used this thick thread in order to emulate a hand knit surface. And if you guys want to talk about this one, I've broken it down on stream once before some time ago, but maybe I'll make a new version of something like this and show you this kind of fake intarsia knitting. I'm happy to do a breakdown on this one as we come up into the holidays. If you guys want to learn the sweater knit method that I do here, um, I do think someday I will uh, pressure my good friend Brian Bailey at Brilliance to see if we can do some more automation around something like this someday. It's a pipe dream. It might be a decade away. I don't know. But I would love to see some automation on this kind of stuff too. Really kind of interesting stuff. But yeah, we can do a breakdown on that on another day. Today, we will do the original breakdown I was going to talk about real quick. Um, but we'll go ahead and say, yeah, the, the uh, woolly nylon filane, I know people do use it. Uh, Sally says it's gun old. Thank you, Sally, for bringing it up. Filane is gun old. Lovely thread makes loads of lint. Absolutely. So does the Bermalonico, especially. Um, the wool blend makes lint. But for my money, this guy right here, the cotton thread made way too much lint for me in general. It's not a bad thread to use. Just be prepared to be cleaning out that needle area or the, the hook race area. Be prepared to be lubricating that machine and know that there will be lint involved. 
Um, I had more trouble. And this is just, this is anecdotal. So this is not me saying I don't like it. I do like it. And I actually run it for other things, but I had more trouble with the cotton thread than I did with the wool blend. The wool blend was a little smoother, went through the needle a little better for me. The cotton thread is a little rougher and I found was creating some extra friction and I had to deal with that. So your mileage may vary. Just be aware that if you use thick threads and especially I found the cotton to be for me a little harder to work with. So let's grab some software. First thing I'm gonna say here, we're back in in Brilliance right now, but I just wanted to show you again um, this is that pattern I was talking about. This is one of those swatch tests. And because people often ask me about this, I'm going to literally pull this up and say, actually, it wasn't. Because I was using thick thread, I didn't go all the way down to 0.4 mils. So uh, congratulations, Eric, for being really safe. So like I told you, it was thicker thread than standard uh, machine embroidery thread. I went only down to 4.5 points. So I gave myself a little half point uh, extra spacing in there. So 4.5 points of density down here. And at the very top, we had 30 points of density. So incredibly low densities up top. But all of them have the same stitch length. You can see this is a four millimeter length that I was working on. All of them have uh, the same stitch pattern. So it's kind of like a traditional tatami style pattern called wicker over here in the patterns, at least for stitch artists. And all of them have the same underlay settings. So they're all using that same underlay setup. And in fact, in this particular piece, instead of using a stock underlay, I wanted to be very controlled. And I actually made them out of a fill, which is a 30 point fill. And I made my own underlay so that they were all exactly how I wanted them exactly the same. And I didn't have any travel stitches inside of these. I wanted to be very clear on what the coverage was going to look like. So just to show you, this is the kind of swatch test I'm talking about. And I was actually careful. I, I give myself some extra credit that I didn't know I, I got to, to claim here. Instead of going all the way down to um, full coverage for uh, polyester or rayon, I went down just to 4.5 points, a little bit higher than that, a little bit of extra breathing room because I was working on thicker thread. All right, so let's go talk about our little Slavic flower design again. So just to make it clear and help you remember, this is the design we're going to be talking about in just a second. Um, this is the little isolated flower. But just to show you where it originally came from for fun, I thought, why not? Let's go ahead and show you the original design. This is the original design that I was working from. So I'll go ahead and put myself out of the frame. Um, this is the original piece. Uh, and I actually right now do not have a sample of this. And it was not originally made for that, that thread. It was made for a poly thread that had some texture to it. It was not made for that thick thread originally. So it does have a slightly looser density because I wanted it to be a little bit looser, a little bit handmade. And I used, I believe, a spun poly very much like the one I was showing you. Uh, but it wasn't made with all of that stuff. So it wasn't made with all of that um, extra thought toward the thicker thread. And you can also see that some of the uh, some of these pieces change. They're not quite like the design. We can see stitch angles changing within the piece. It is a little bit different than what we were dealing with in the other setup. So as we can see, it's really made out of a few different kinds of stitches. We've got some satin stitches. We've got some back stitches. We have some stem stitches. And that's really all it is. But if we're kind of careful to look at it, you can see that this flower, at least as it is here, is the basis for the flower that I isolated. So this is the entire design I started with, the entire layout. It's a much larger layout. Uh, but in this case, and, and because people ask me about this once again, I'll go ahead and go to this. This is about uh, eight and three quarter inches wide, close to nine inches in total. Um, so this is like a nine inch wide piece by about almost five inches wide or five inches tall. So that was the original version of it that I was working from, the original design panel. But we isolated a small piece of it and then created that for the thick threads. So let's go ahead and go into the actual flower recreation here. And I'll show you the original piece. And we'll also go into another one that I redid in, in Brilliance to give you some concepts about it. So this is the original piece. And as we can see, the one you're looking at, this is the same as uh, our sample right here. That's the sample run in Madeira Burmalana thread. This is the original uh, as it was digitized. So we, things we can tell about it, because I talk about design breakdowns all the time, what are the things that we can tell about it just by looking? Well, first thing we can tell about it is that we have ourselves a nice back stitch here. We have a similar back or stem stitch here. We'd have to look at it to see exactly how it's set up. The one that I did here is actually a little different on the right-hand side, has more texture, so it's a later iteration of this piece. But this is the one that we were looking at in the actual sample. We can tell we have some nice light densities in this piece. 
how can we tell? Because we kind of know by scale that we can see these are light densities when we're looking at it at a one-to-one -one scale. But here's where we go back into our tool we learned earlier, right? Let's go to our measurement tool. Here's our ruler. And if we're going to be kind of getting a feeling for the stitches, we generally want to pick an area. And let me zoom back out here. Generally want to pick an area where the stitches are pretty straight, pretty perpendicular. And if we measure from point to point, I click, if I grab my ruler, I click and I drag from point to point on the satin. Over down here on the right hand side, or on the bottom left hand side, you can see, and I'll, I can, can't really point it out with my cursor without letting go. If you look at the bottom right hand side, the length is set at 0 0.9 millimeters. So, what is this? This is exactly what Madeira would recommend for this thread. So like I said, 0.8 to 0.9, and particularly this is what Madeira recommends for the density on this thread, 0.9 millimeters or nine embroidery points in the final setup. So certainly, does it get tighter and looser depending on where we are in the piece? Absolutely. When we're on curves, sometimes it's tighter on the inside of a curve, sometimes it's looser on the outside of a curve. We also have short stitches. And depending on how your settings are done, you may have short stitches to avoid uh, excess density at the edges. That's that three-dimensional density where we're packing too many uh, stitch penetration points all close together. And we can also see we have nice long lengths on these uh, back stitches and that they overlap and create some texture. So once again, let's go ahead and grab ourselves a look at that final piece. And we can see that we've got some texture in that area. We have these stitches that lay out a little bit, but the thickness of the thread reduces some of that texture just by being so thick that we're getting to densities that are close together. They're like a fill, they're like a satin, but they tilt out to the side because of the nature of the stitch. So let's back up and let's look at this piece uh, as reconstructed here in Stitch Artist. And here is a reconstruction piece. The things that are interesting about it to look at are um, overlapping and pathing. Certainly you can see that each one of these pieces is overlapped by the next petal in the row. So the sequencing is done so that we have those overlaps that give us some nice texture, some carving. The other things that are interesting to notice, uh, the angle of these stitches as they turn around. This is just, like I said, a back or a sim stitch. In the case of running this specifically, in Stitch Artist, these are a stem stitch. The length is 5.6 millimeters. That's the length of this unit here. We have that piece that's 5.6 mils. The width is four mils, but we have a rotation, which is the angle of these stitches off the line of about 17 degrees. Just to show you what that means, if I change the rotation, you can see how uh, it changes how that rotation is of the stitches to the line that we drew, right? So in that case, we'll go back to where we were it is about 17 degrees, right? So that's 17 degrees of rotation to get that look. And as we can see, because of, of the thickness here, when we build up multiple stitches, even though it looks like there's a lot of gaps in here, you saw in that final piece, that um, those gaps are not necessarily all that um, egregious. They don't look like gaps, why? Because lines on our, um, on our screen cannot show us the thickness of that thread, especially generally most 3D previews are not made to show us. Um, in fact, I don't know any software that's showing us the thickness of the thread as part of the 3D preview. So we have to understand it's gonna look a little sparse. But if we're looking at the actual piece, you can see even with those huge gaps that are in here, um, they cozy up pretty nicely, especially with that super fuzzy, super thick thread. So that's something to look at. That's what that how that's put together. But you can see that I'm using that to make nice, thick, textured lines instead of using straight stitches. The other thing that's fairly interesting is we can see in this column, as we're getting toward the end of this satin stitch that's here in kind of this stamen that's in the middle of the piece, I'm angling my stitch angles as we get toward the end so that when we transition into our back stitch here, the stitch angles of my satin meet with the angle of this back stitch or of this stem. Now, I believe this one's actually a stem stitch. So it meets the angles of the stem stitch. On the earlier piece, it was just a simple back stitch, but we can see why does it look continuous? Because as we're traveling to the end of my satin stitch, I end the satin stitch and then pick up on that next stitch right here, meeting the angle and transitioning into the natural angle of the back stitch that creates this textured kind of curl. So I'm watching my stitch angles very carefully and I'm blending the stitch angle of my satin into the angle 
of that central piece of that central little curl as it develops. This one, of course, has the multiple stitch pieces of a stem. This one here is a very simple back stitch with an angle treatment to it. So it depends on which version you have that it'll look a little bit different, but you can still see the same kind of smoothing going on. It's a little harder to see how it'll turn out here because we don't have that thickness of the thread to let us know. But if we go ahead and go back to the original piece and throw that up on screen, you can see that as we're moving into that angle, as we're getting up toward that central element, the angle of the stitches start to mesh, start to meet the angle of the stem or the back stitch that's up there, and it makes it look smoother and it makes the transition less jarring. And it lets us make that thicker line of the satin stitch transition into that kind of motif like, run like stitch of that stem or back stitch element that we used. Other thing is, you guys like to often see the sequencing behind these pieces. I talked about the layering a little bit, but let's go ahead and go into this. Mo the, modern element for this piece. This one particularly starts at the back end. We stitch through our stem stitch. We travel out. We have a simple edge run with a one mil, so 10 point inset. We have very thick threads, so we have to realize that our inset should be thicker. Even with some pull compensation, we want the inset on this to be a little thicker also. Bohemian style, it's okay if the edges are not extra, extra crisp. They should look like thick hand stitching. It's okay to have a little texture, but I wanted some support for those edges. So I do have an edge run with a three millimeter length set. Also the straight travel runs are three millimeters in length, just to let you know. We travel up to here. We can see that I have made a nice flat cut end. It's going to be hidden by the next piece. So we have this next piece that comes across. We run that piece, actually start and end on that are incorrectly set. And I will fix that literally while we're talking here, because why not? Because I can. Uh, yeah, I reconstructed this piece right before we got done here with the show. Hey, here we go. <laughs> so my start and end were set incorrectly. I have a run that runs out to the end that I did manually, and then I had to set my start and end point correctly. Pardon, but that's what happens in the real world when you do live. <laughs> All right, so once we get to the end of this piece, we go back, it travels out, does the edge, and it should end here. So efficiency, we're trying to end where we start on the next piece. It travels out to the end of the next leaf. You'll see that it also, you're, I'm gonna kind of point this out, I'm gonna zoom in. You're gonna see that I'm not tucking in very deeply because I know that these, as these stack up, the density will let it push up. We're gonna push toward the open end and pull toward the center of the stitch. It's going to push in and push deeper. So I just stopped just inside of this junction. I could overlap deeper, but then I'd have more buildup of density here and thickness. And I don't want that, especially with this thick thread. Everywhere you see a junction, you'll see that I'm just barely touching. I'm just barely overlapping because I don't want to have a tremendous amount of density, a tremendous amount of layering built up in that area. But let's go back to it now that we fixed our sequencing problem. Start into that, we go to that leaf, it travels out to the end and finishes up, I must have done two of them. Let's say that again and watch. So I'll, I'll just do it live one more time. That's what I get for redigitizing something right at the last moment from my old suppliers since I wanted to show you guys settings. All right, so once again, you are gonna see, uh, if we look down here in the bottom right hand corner, this is a nine point density. Like I said, since I wanted to show settings, we have a four mil stitch length on that piece. Not that it matters in this particular case because we're not getting that large. But the other thing to remember, like I showed you earlier, we have an edge run on this piece with a full on 10 point inset. So it's like a millimeter. It's a really deep inset for that edge run because we've got those nice thick stitches and I'm okay with a little bit of edge texture. So back to our draw, let's go back through it one more time. So as we go through this piece, we're going to start in that green one more time. Go out here, leaf, 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 leaf to the center travel out, and once again, my start and ends are wrong. And so that's what happens when I crash a bunch. <laughs> this should travel out to the outer end. So let's go ahead and go in here one more time. My end point should be up here. <laughs> and we'll go ahead and run through it like this. Leaf, 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 leaf. Travel toward the outer end, and finally we stitch out to the outside edge. So there we go. <laughs> one more time to justify my ego since I have my bruised confidence after having set my endpoints wrong and not saved my file. There we go, to the ends, traveling logically, <laughs> up to the top and out through the end. And as you can see, as I turn toward the end, I've done a really tight curve here because it makes this small buildup of thread that actually makes kind of a small knot. And I liked the look of this thick end on that curve. So I just used the nature of the stitching to make that happen. Then we do the same thing here. We have our satin stitch, 
small overlap. We curve into this one. You can see that I've changed the angles so that the angles interact in such a way that they don't split the stitches underneath them. Curves down to the bottom. Do the same thing here. We overlap. We use a run stitch to travel up to the top, and it looks like I may have done this correctly this time. Travel down to the bottom, we overlap again, and we overlap again, ending in the center. So I guess at least in the pink, I didn't mess up my <laughs> certain endpoints. <laughs> Suffice it to say, what we're looking for, the things that are interesting to look at here is I'm coming in at an angle where you can see that each one of these stitches can kind of land in a different space between the other stitches so we don't split apart the stitches on top. You can always work and adjust this stuff. If you have issues where you're getting splitting, you might want to change your stitch angles a little bit or the way that you finish your end stitching so that you can see if we zoom in really tight, these two stitches might land between these two stitches on the underlying piece, but then this stitch lands between these two, this stitch lands between these two. And in this case, we don't have the top stitching pulling apart the stitching underneath it, right? It doesn't pull it apart and leave a gap. So we may work on those angles in order to get that to happen. You're also going to see that because I'm coming in at this inclination here, that I then change inclinations and turn across it because that's going to provide us some shadow and that change of, of angle is going to provide a change in the light, the way that the light is reflected. And if we look at the actual final piece, you can see that without having a second color or defining anything or outlining anything, I get that lovely little bit of dimension here. You get a small shadow where that overlap happens and part of that shadow is because I've turned my stitch angle and I'm crossing it at a different angle. So there's a contrast between the angle of the underlying petal and the petal that's on the top of it. And as we look at this piece, you can kind of see how those different overlaps came together. And even though we're stopping right in the dead center of that middle petal, um, it really, even with a, a small tie off knot, doesn't have excessive texture and the fuzzy thread hides a lot of sins here. It doesn't really have any issues with those just budding together. And as you can see, once again, I've just very, very, tightly I, I control how much i'm butting those together because with that pushing with that extra thick thread i don't want to try and stack several stitches right in that same spot so that's how that design was put together uh the things that are interesting aside from watching me flounder when i don't put my <laughs> start and end points in the right place things that are interesting to watch out for on this are um, you may have to look at whether or not you're getting shortening in these corners you can see i've got some stitch shortening here um, in here i don't have as much shortening Depends on your densities. The angles are a little bit different on this piece than the other piece. Uh, also, if you're working in Embrilliant specifically or in Stitch Artist, make sure you're actually set to a 12 weight thread because the automatic shortening routines actually know what kind of thread you're using. If you have a 12 weight thread, or even if it's not the same 12 weight that's in your charts, uh, set it to one of the 12 weight threads because the, the stitch shortening routine knows the thickness based on the thread you've selected. It's something that's just part of Brilliance. It's not part of all software. In other softwares, you may want to look at your stitch shortening routine and make sure that it makes sense for the thickness that you're working with. If you have adjustable um, automatic short stitches, you want to make sure that they're kicking off for the density that makes sense for your particular design. If you're shortening those stitches up, you don't necessarily only want them to shorten the way they would for a 40 weight thread because you might build up excessive, um, excessive density on the inside of tight curves especially. And that excessive density means we're putting needle points really close together and then we can get things like thread breakage. And people don't often think, because it's an automated setting, people don't often think about the automated shortening and you end up where you're not shortening stitches where you probably should be. And in fact, you can see on this, the piece on the left, I did not adjust all the shortening probably as much as I should have. Whereas the piece on the right, I've got more stitch shortening on the inside curves. And that's due to the fact that it actually intelligently is already aware of my 12 weight thread. So that, like I said, that may depend on what software you're using, but if you're in Stitch Artist, by all means, select a 12 weight thread uh, in your color palette because it will let the software know that there's more to deal with that stitch shortening and it understands what target density should be for that thread. But in any case, you do have to kind of watch out for stitch shortening. The things that I talk about all the time, stitch length, my travel stitches on this piece really are longer than most travel stitches would be. The travel stitches are three millimeters. A lot of the time I'm doing much smaller ones to hold them tight and make sure they don't pop out, but I don't like doing excessively small stitches on this stuff. You may also watch out for your tie-ons, tie-offs. If they're doing 0.4 millimeter tie-ons and tie-offs, um, that's not exactly a great plan. Your minimum stitches should be set longer because we don't want to have anything much under a millimeter, uh, especially not a bunch of them all put together with this Bermelana because that's a good recipe for a thread break. 
And like I said, always watch the inside of curves. And that's that's when we're doing 3D foam at extremely high densities. That's when we're doing satin stitches if we don't have our auto turn, auto uh, stitch shortening turned on. Watch the inside of curves because the inside of tight curves is always where we're going to get an excessive buildup of density. Even on pieces like this, we can see that there's more density building up on the inside of curves, even when, when I've been careful to balance it out and tilt. And you can see that there's more of an oblique angle coming out of these tops, even though I did that to try and help that out. The density here, we look closely at it, the density in the kind of straight run of the satin stitch is not the same as the density in the corner of that tight curve. So you are going to have to watch with how you use your angles, how you travel in and out of curves when you're using extremely thick thread. However, to tie this all up with a bow, because we are well into bonus time, let's go ahead and let this just be the case that we understand all of these discussions we're having, whether we're talking about materials, whether we're talking about digitizing, these are all centered around the nature of the medium. When we're talking about thread, the chief things we need to look at are our thread weight or our thread thickness. We can also look at things like the texture or, or you can kind of say the sheen, but it really is the texture because you can have thin material or thin threads that have a matte finish, but it is the texture, it is the fuzziness. And that can also affect how it travels through a needle and it can affect our densities that we select. So we need to understand that when we change things like thread weight, we have to work with our needle size and structure the right, correct way, right? When we're talking about fabric, then we need to think about our stretch, loft, and texture. And also, uh, to a degree, we have to think about nap as well with that one, naps and fibers, things like that. But we're really about mitigating texture with things like topping. We're about using stabilizer to stabilize the fabric and arrest unnecessary movement, and certainly making sure that we're hooped in a way that makes sense for the fabric, not to put it under undue stress, but not to let it move unnecessarily. The deal is this. If we take time to understand the nature of the medium and the interactions with our materials and to measure, to make sure that we are in the kind of tolerances that are required, that we listen to our vendors, our machine manufacturers, and use those baselines to help us understand what we're doing, even materials we've never worked with before or materials that may be non-standard for embroidery can be used effectively. If we know what the results are, we can use the palette we build of those results to show people what's possible and to get repeatable execution that consistently gives us the results we expect. And it allows us to express ourselves in ways that we would not be able to if we just have that magical thinking of something should fix this. Understand the fabric and how it moves and the texture that it has. Understand the stabilizer and what its job is. Understand what the topping is for. Know that the interactions between things like stitch angles and stitch length in your software have effects on this interaction. And remember that materials matter. But never forget that with a little bit of logic, a little bit of observation, and a little bit of testing, and a whole lot of forgiveness for yourself and grace for when you invariably mess up something, or at least come up with a result you didn't expect, you can achieve more than you think you can, and you can get repeatable results from just about any material. All right, with that, folks, let's let that be the end of Education Friday and all this crazy bonus time, and I hope you guys have a wonderful time coming out of this, and I absolutely want to talk to you about this again next week. we got a couple more comments. I'm going to grab a couple of them. So last couple of them. Brian says, embroidery threads hold together better uh, during sewing than, for example, woolly for surgery use. So don't please follow your timing. You fluff up the thread after the design is done. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Fluff up the thread after, for sure. But that's something something for sure I would say you want to think about. Embroidery threads hold better. And also the, the, the threads I showed you today, the stuff like Bermelana, that's made for embroidery. That's sold by Madeira for embroidery. So take a look at it. It is different. It is not the same. If you're going to brush it to make it wooly, then yeah, that's a very different process. But yeah, the stuff that we're talking about, uh, the stuff I've talked about today, that is made for embroidery. It is not in, intended in any other way. So it is something that's made to be used that way. Last couple of things here too. Um, yeah, love the, the, the idea of mimicking handwork. It is something cool to do. Yeah, thread shortening. It's something to look at. It's something not, people, not a lot of people think about, but luckily we had Brian thinking about it for us as far as brilliance goes. And like I said, it's something that you might want to take a look at. Uh, certainly think about your materials, 
Think about how they go together and try some testing. There's great stuff that you can get done. And I'll see you again next week. Can't wait to get out there and test some more.